So, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Victoria. I'm a European Bureau Chief with Air Transport World. And uh, today I'm going to be moderating the first panel. So, I'd like to invite uh, our first panelist to please come to the stage. And while they're joining us and uh, getting comfy in their seats, I'll just give you a bit more of an introduction. So first up, I'd like to thank A4E for the opportunity to moderate this panel and to speak today. It's a real pleasure to be here. Um, I've worked in the aviation industry for about the last 20 years. Um, I've worked in airline ground operations, chasing around passengers and luggage. I've um, worked as an analyst for a manufacturer, so Bombardier, and uh, finally, I've spent quite a long time in aviation journalism, working with Graham as one of my former colleagues, and uh, now for Aviation Week Network. So it looks like I'm now joined by the panel, and for the next 50 minutes, we're going to be having a conversation about, um, I'm going to check the title here, European Aviation, How Airlines Are Central to European Success. Now, I think that that brings up a few further questions, which is, what does a European success actually look like? What is the role of aviation within that? And are airlines actually central to European success? So those are just random ideas. This isn't going to be a scripted conversation. The panelists don't have a series of bullet points to work down. We are actually going to have a conversation. And my ch challenge to the panel is twofold. One of them is to make this more like a dinner party conversation <laughs> than like a job interview. And then the second challenge is to try to bring something interesting to the conversation, perhaps that hasn't been heard before. I know that the benefits of aviation is a very talked about subject. So how can we put a new perspective, a new slant on that, and basically keep everybody away from their work email, which is your main competitor here. <laughs> so I'm going to come and take a seat. Oops. And park those over there. Fantastic microphone transition there. Now I feel very, very echoey. OK, so to begin with, I'd like to invite each of our panelists to introduce themselves. Um, I think that uh, my ability with pronouncing names is going to be nowhere near their abilities to pronounce their own names. And also, if you could introduce yourselves along with what you're bringing to the conversation, so the perspective that you bring, because we have Boeing as a manufacturer, we have some politicians, we have an airline CEO, so it would be helpful to know what angle you're bringing to the conversation. So maybe I'll start at the far end of the panel. If you'd like to bring Hi, thank yourself you, in. Thank you, Victoria. Josiane Kutair, member of the European Parliament. And uh, to bring something maybe different than the normal political talk, let me first speak on my experience as a European citizen, coming from the smallest member state, Malta, and being the first elected representative from the smaller island of Gozo. And we don't have any airlines coming there, apart from the helicopter service, which transports patients to so the main hospital in Malta. But what I can say is that I'm very passionate about connectivity in general and about uh, efficient transport um, modes, because I know firsthand what it means to come from the periphery, from the smaller island facing double insularity, and therefore it's one of my passionate areas of work, connectivity, whether it's digital or trans the transport sector. I'm a member of the Transport and Tourism Committee and uh, also a member of the Tourism Task Force within the same committee. And therefore, I also recognize the important role that the aviation industry has upon our tourism sector in Europe. And as one of the southern countries I come from, which, which GDP depends a lot on tourism, I know firsthand what that means too. And what's the role of, uh, of aviation industry towards uh, our single market? It's a question of free movement. It's a question of provision of services too. It's a question of uh, the citizens, irrespective of where they are coming from, to travel, not only to travel, not only to have that airline connection, but to have also adequate connections which are affordable, which is an important po point I bring forward within my work and my committees, but also bringing an added value to our different regions, whether they are islands, 
remote regions, central regions, and those coming from less connected regions realize how important this is socially. Because for me, adequate connections, adequate routes, frequent, frequent ones, and also a good, good time frame to arrive within a particular destination is not only a question of free movement, but also a question of social justice towards our citizens coming from less connected regions. And this is so, so something I brought forward within the report I negotiated some months ago within the Reggie Committee, where we spoke upon islands and cohesion policy, and we also recognized the role that aviation plays there. Obviously, there needs to be the environmental aspect, which we have heard private speakers and also our commissioners speaking about it, taken into effect. And this shift is not only about the environmental goals, but it's also a question now of being independent when it comes to having our own um, uh, clean fuels and our own fuels to not reply extremely on third countries and not to have history repeating itself, but also to have a social and economic positive impact. So I'll stop here for now and I look forward to the continuance of the discussion. Thank you. So very much a social connectivity angle because of the nature of the place where you come from, but also because of nature of European connectivity and how important that is. So thank you and welcome. Um, maybe we'll move along the panel. I won't normally do this, but it helps to do it in order this time. So, Darren, if you'd like to introduce yourself. Sure. Uh, my name is Darren Hulse, and I lead uh, our commercial marketing team at uh, Boeing Commercial Aircraft. And I guess what I bring is uh, something similar in a slightly different way, which is we're passionate about connectivity as well, and um, also innovation. And I think. Um, a combination of enabling connectivity through the use of uh, efficient, capable aircraft, as well as continued innovation to make sure our industry is as efficient and sustainable as possible, kind of go hand in hand. Because when you think about it, the, the two things most closely linked together when we look at uh, the history and future of, of aviation is uh, the, how interconnected GDP and, and travel really are. And um, it's really a virtuous cycle as connectivity enables economic development. And I think we'll talk a little bit about, about how the last 20 or 30 years in Europe are just a great example of how that can work uh, so positively. Yeah, so. absolutely. Um, we've already heard it mentioned a few times this morning that uh, the 1st of January 1993, which was 30 years ago, was when the third package of European liberalization came into effect. And uh, clearly when we're looking at that topic of European success. Um, I think that that's an example that we can go to. And I also brought along this report in case we're interested. You'll notice that it's not a brand that's represented here today. It was written by British Midland. I'm a hoarder. That was from 1997 that that was published. And um, what it was is in 1997, they were looking at what still was yet to be done from liberalization. And I think that that could feed into our conversation today. So yeah, absolutely, sustainability, liberalized markets, competition, using the right equipment, those are going to be themes today. So, Carlos, your perspective. Hi, Julia. Good to see you and to see everybody in this dinner party format that uh, Julia wanted, except the lights are a bit strong. Normally, in a dinner party, you don't have that. But jokes aside, and what I... <laughs> and a little glass of wine would be yeah, more than right. But anyway, that's not anyway, politically correct. So, briefly put, <laughs> what I bring, I think, to this discussion, well, A, I'm an airline CEO, member actually of Airlines for Europe, and, uh, and uh, you know, somebody at Airlines for Europe is thinking very well about this because I think, you know, having Boeing obviously makes a lot of sense. Having somebody from Malta and the minister from, uh, from uh, Iceland, you know, everything said already, right, about connectivity and the needs for connectivity. What's less obvious, well, they actually is very focused on small markets and actually islands are 65% of our, of our summer activity. So, you know, we're, we're sort of islanders uh, in a sense. So I, I bring the airline CEO angle. At a personal level, if you want, I'm very strongly motivated, as, as we've discussed uh, in, in the past, Victoria, uh, on, uh, on liberalization. And actually, I'm a convinced uh, a Europhile entrepreneur and Europhile. And I think the liberalization, which I had in 92, I guess it came into effect in January 93. <laughs> but I have some statistics that later, if you know, in our dinner party, it makes sense, I'm happy to, mm. to share, because it's huge what it's done to, to Europe. And I've actually, this is my second airline, I started the first one also called Boiling, which is now part of Luis's group in IG. And uh, the combination of, uh, 
Voiling, I actually don't know exactly their numbers, but I'd say they've carried more than 250 million, maybe. Bolotea, we just celebrated 50 million passengers. So I actually do know, and it matters a lot to me and to my team, that 300 million people travel, and it's funny, especially in Bolotea, it's a lot of VFR. It's a lot of students, a lot of visiting your family, it's a lot of hospital traffic, it's again a lot of island traffic. So that, that's a huge thing. And last, just to finish this quick, at a personal level, I have my wife is American, so connectivity is all about, you know, being from two continents, and if you miss that, you know, it's like uh, pretty dramatic, frankly. And then especially <laughs> my biggest, toughest investors and public is, I have four kids, the two oldest are twins, almost 16, and they care a lot about, you know, hey, their daddy is an airline CEO, that's, so, it used to be much cooler. Now, it's sort of cool, but what do you do about the, the environment? So I think, you know, all of those angles if it's not too many. <laughs> it's yep. what I, I think care that about. this is a very rich and wide subject. I'm sure that we could do the entire conference day. Uh, for the moment we've got this 50 minute slot, but I think that uh, Volatea is a really interesting airline to have represented on this panel because Volatea flies to a lot of the markets that you wouldn't necessarily expect. You've got a very niche business model. It's you're not a regional airline, you're not right up there with the huge low costs, you serve those in between secondary markets. And again, if we're talking about European success, how do you measure that? If that's connectivity of goods, services, people, open markets, you're really seizing that opportunity and perhaps we can go further into that if the conversation takes us that way. So thank you and welcome. So finally, Lilia, if you'd like to introduce yourself. Thank you and thank you for hosting this uh, talks and the importance of putting a, a highlight on the importance of the aviation industry in Europe. So I come from Iceland, I'm the Minister of uh, Fun, I'm not kidding you. <laughs> so I'm the Minister of Tourism, Culture and Business Affairs. So in my portfolio, obviously I have tourism, which I'm very proud of. And then, you know, films, music, uh, restaurants, bars. So obviously I have the best portfolio in the cabinet. <laughs> and what I kind of bring to this table is that uh, tourism and connectivity is of key importance to Iceland. So if you just look at the avi aviation industry, it's about 14% of GDP. 30% of our export revenues come through tourism. And we wouldn't have this high standard of living in Iceland unless we would be a flight hub in the North Atlantic Ocean. So for us, that, you know, liberalization and level playing field is the most important. We wouldn't have this high quality of life unless we had tourism. And tourism has grown very rapidly in the last 10 years. We've gone from um, about 500,000 tourists to 2 million. And as a consequence of that, you know, we obviously have a, a lot higher, you know, FX revenues and lower debt levels. So it's very, very important from an economic point of view. And what I also kind of want to mention here is like one of my concerns uh, is the uh, fit for 55. First, when I heard it, I was like, should I be fit for before I'm 55? <laughs> or no, but this is a huge question on, on green policy. And Iceland is a very green country, not only literally, you heard about the Joe Greenland, Iceland, that, that whole thing. But what we also bring to the table is like 85% of all our uh, energy is green, either through hydro or geothermal. And we are very ambitious on reaching, you know, c carbon neutrality at uh, 2040. But with this new act, we are really being uh, challenged because our connectivity is, you know, you know, it's like 2,000, you know, kilometers to Reykjavik, and we are not basically in the, in the heart of Europe. But we are in the heart of Europe because of connectivity and all the flights that are coming from Europe, stopping in the hub in Reykjavik, and then going to the U.S. If we wouldn't have this, our GDP would be much lower than we have today. So this is a huge economic question. But we want to join in, we want to contribute and uh, focus on making, uh, you know, liberalize the industry and uh, uh, play our part. I think that that brings up quite a few themes in there. On the one hand, you're saying that aviation quite literally is existential for your economy in terms of 
what that brings, how much it supports the country, uh, far more so than perhaps some other countries. Um, but also the fact that, I mean, Iceland among all countries, I remember once taking a shower in Iceland and being really, really surprised by the water because it was geothermal and it smelled really strongly of sulfur. I love and the smell. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it was just surprising yeah, because yeah, yeah. it's obviously it's quite unusual for a non-Icelander yeah. to experience that. So, you know, you do have this very environmentally friendly culture, environment, um, but at the same time there is perhaps this existential threat as well from having to push that along too quickly or that costing too much money or that impacting your airlinks. So, yeah, that's going to be another topic for discussion. I also love the idea of being Minister of Fun. Yeah. I think that sounds brilliant. <laughs> when we were talking about what... I'm trying to sell this at home. They don't <laughs> believe me, no. <laughs> it's like every, everybody that's having a nice night out in Iceland somehow links back to you. That's great. Yeah, so, you know, when I'm out during the night time, you know, at the bars and... And people are asking me, so well, why are you in the bars? I'm like, this is my territory and I'm the minister of bars, so I can actually <laughs> <Pretty> do that. <laughs> that brings up questions for me about whether you get loads of free drinks, but let us... <laughs> Can't go into that. No, yeah. I'm just kidding. Uh, Moving on. Yeah, so. Okay. Um, so to, to <laughs> attempt to introduce a bit of fun into the panel, we're going to go to a quick poll. It's also to test whether you're awake and whether or not you're looking at your work emails. Please, I invite you to enjoy the experience here in the room. So, uh, yeah, pop quiz. There is a correct answer. This isn't just an opinion piece. Um, so the question for our audience is, how many vaccines were shipped through Brussels Airport, Europe's most important pharmaceutical hub? Is this sponsored? Um, in 2021 and 2022. So uh, I don't know if you already have the Slido app. Um, it's also a relevant introduction to our Q&A. If you're able to scan that QR code, you should be able to access the question and answer session. There's also 1.0 microphones going to be in the room as well. Um, so if you download the app or go onto the website or however it works, um, then you'll be able to participate in this poll. So how many vaccines were shipped through Brussels Airport in 2021 and 2022? Uh, if you would like to enter your educated guess now, I'm wondering whether people have had an opportunity to do that while I've been talking, or whether you still need a few more moments. I was just trying to forget this period in my life, but you know, you wanna talk about it, uh, it's fine. It's, it's time travel, it pulls you straight back to, uh, to that experience. And of course, this is one of the things that we're here to talk about today, is that during COVID, we had the wake up call of not having aviation. And um, also, we can bring in the theme of the other time when we had no aviation, which was, uh, actually, I ought to correct myself on that. We did not have aviation because freight activity was still very, very strong, as illustrated by this question, but no passenger transport. And then we also had the Icelandic, Icelandic ash crisis. Uh, you probably all remember that. I can actually pronounce that. Yeah, you can. Somebody from Iceland I hear me over a work dinner. Oh, very good. There yeah. we go. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, we had those two moments. And it reminded me of the Brian Adams song, Baby When You're Gone. And it's kind of, you realize what you're missing out on when you don't have it. Yeah. But how long does that last in the memory? So it's like, do you just get over it? <laughs> If I may button a bit here. Yeah. <laughs> at the moment, at the European Parliament, we have the temporary committee relating to lessons learned and recommendations following the COVID-19 pandemic. And one of the amendments that I have inserted just yesterday is the recognition of uh, the important role which transport workers and the aviation industry played in this regard. So whilst, yes, we were having this, uh, we were missing our flights, and it was said once um, the, the flight started going again to travel, um, even myself to the European Parliament for my work and seeing airports empty, and a flight nearly empty, it, was, it gave you this very sad feeling, that lack of activity, it, it was very sad and it was something which we were not accustomed to. It was more difficult to travel for all of us who needed to travel. There was, were less routes and we still need to discuss, I think, the issue of lost routes and whether these have all been back. What's the effect? 
Is there some effect still from the pandemic or are we going back to, to pre-pandemic levels, not only from the number of tourists, but when it comes to the connections and the routes, which are also important for the quality of the transport service and the tourism service. But we also need to recognize those transport workers, those airlines, which were crucial to bring in medical supplies, medical devices, uh, masks, vaccines, because those living on islands or those depending on air travel needed these connections to actually survive. And I believe that this is an element which we must not forget and which we must keep in mind. And then also the question of the EU COVID vaccine certificate, which was highly debated within, within the European Parliament, within industry. And I know that A4E also participated within, within this discussion and it was important. It's essential that we keep in mind this experience and not forget, not because it was a beautiful period, not at all, but we must keep in mind the resilience brought forward, the cooperation, between the, the public authorities, between the EU, between the industry, which was very much important and we must recognize also those transport workers, including in the aviation field, which were also frontliners and which couldn't stay at home, but were there also on the front line to make sure that certain regions which depend on aviation had their, their vaccines, had their essential supplies, also flown in from, from other regions. Yep, 100%. And I think that you've made a good point there about the reason why we're all able to be here today is because of things like the reopening of borders with COVID passports and with the vaccines that enabled the world to get back to normal-ish, even though COVID is still out there. So, yep, absolutely. It's the fact that it continued behind the scenes but also allowed and paved the way for that reopening too. So let's jump back to our question and uh, see how we're getting on in the room. So if you haven't cast your vote yet, you have about three seconds to do it, and we're going to reveal the answer. <laughs> Here we go. Okay, so the most popular vote... Oh, we're going to go back one. There we are. The most popular vote was 500 million vaccines were transported through Brussels Airport. Remember, this is just Brussels. Um, in 2021 and 2022, the most popular answer was 48% saying 500 million. The answer was double that. And I think that that's a real eye-opener for the role that aviation played in the vaccine rollout, supporting what was something which was integral across all of society to try and get the world opening up and moving again and away from the horrific experience of the pandemic. So I think that that's quite a good illustration of the role that regulators, the industry in general and society can play in working together and cooperating to uh, change society, quite literally transform it. So I'm wondering at this point if anybody from the panel wants to jump in with a comment or an observation. Happy to. I must say I've never had a dinner party with Slido in between. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but building on, on what Josiane was saying, and I'll actually, you know, we'll focus more instead of what we lost and appreciated during COVID, of, you know, a great European success, which was all the previous 30 years, right? And I am, I think, significantly, I'm, I'm sure, much older than, than many of my co-panelists. And, you know, I remember that in the late 80s, early 90s, you know, uh, it was, you could tell, it was a bigger difference being Spanish or being French or being German or being, you know, English or, or what have you, or Maltese or Icelandic, sorry. Uh, I, I love when you talk to, to kids now, to, to young people, to candidates especially, in their 20s or whatever, how many languages they speak, how culturally they're totally open-minded, how they think as Europeans, whether or not, you know, they're more Europhiles or Europhobes, etc. I think, obviously, the connectivity has been huge behind that and we're a continent that has its shares of, of failures like every every whatever collective project but this is one of the big successes you know and if i could uh, before minister lilia if minister lilia raises the hand because you're a minister i'm, I'm going to go quiet <laughs> in a second but uh, no just kidding keep the fun part but briefly i, I had you, you told me victoria i think to look at this and again i prefer rather than to speak from memory to check the data but with the liberalization we part did you know that we had only 2500 
intra-European routes in 92, and it's north of 8,000 now, which is, which is huge, right? Everybody, I think, knows the traffic figures, how much is, but I found, or I also have a view on the economic ones, the jobs, etc. but that's one that talks to connectivity more than any other thing. We have, you know, not quite fourth, between three and, and four times the options, right, of flying uh, point to point uh, that, than we did before. And in a continent like us, and again, maybe a good transition to, to somebody from Iceland and, you know, leading the Minister of Fun, including the, <laughs> the tourism part, but I think that's just humongous. And, you know, whatever we do going forward, you know, other than this COVID period recovery, and I'm very glad, I'm very proud that the industry played that role, should bear that in mind. We have a track record of success. We want to make it greener. We want to make it more efficient. But we need to keep that. that that's a, a you know, collective success of Europeans that we cannot throw out the window, in my opinion. Yeah, absolutely. And it's that, like you say, it's connectivity, I guess, on, on the industry side in terms of what's being supplied to the market. But the product that you're giving to the customer is ultimately choice yeah. and mobility. And when I was looking back at the statistics from this, um, in 1993, 2% of intra-European scheduled routes uh, had three or more airlines competing. That's now risen to 8% with three or more airlines competing. But what you have to remember is that the industry as a whole has grown so much within that that you're talking about an awful lot more routes with competition and therefore choice for the customer. Can I say one thing on that, if I may, Lilia, one mm -hmm. second? It's actually, I checked the same statistics, and it's funny because at a complementary angle to what you're mm -hmm. saying, from memory, more or less, I didn't write this one down, but like 40% of routes in 92 had one carrier. You've dropped that to a little bit more than 20%. So there is much more competition, and we all know this, right? We as Europeans. The actual price of, of intra-European travel in real terms, European Commission is the source, has dropped more than 70%. So it used to be a luxury when I was, you know, 20, it was a luxury to travel. A few people, we all know that, not to, to build on it, but it's a mm -hmm. huge, much more connectivity, much, much more economical. So I think those are treasures we want to, yeah. to keep. So more choice and cheaper, which sounds like a great experience. Darren, I'm going to come back to you in one moment. I'm going to go to Lilia first, but this is absolutely the way we want the panel to go. So I'll come back to you in one moment. So I, I think one of the most important things that we also learned through COVID is the importance of you know meeting people. I think that you know, I, I think actually connectivity uh, influences greater globalization and greater peace. And I think today, I mean, I think that we are ex we're being very challenged by the war in Ukraine, and there are a lot of challenges taking place. We have higher interest rates. We have you know. Uh, this inflation as a result both of the COVID uh, and the, um, the war in Ukraine. So I think the importance of people meeting and talking, and we, you know, uh, Carlos was talking about his kids, and I, I also have kids, and one of the things that we see is that they are a lot, at least my kids, especially my boy, in front of the computer. And I think one of the challenges is also is that people are having these conversations as we are doing today. And uh, the aviation industry um, is so important also for just having people talk. And in order to increase uh, globalization, we now see trends of a certain deglobalization taking place. We see less portfolio investment global, uh, globally. We see actually a, a less increase in uh, trade compared to the last decade. So I think it's so important that, you know, the EU, the relationship with the US, and that we promote globalization because the more globalized the world is, the, the less likelihood is that we have conflicts. So I think just to uh, also in promoting democracy and reduce uh, a more polar pol polarized world. And I'm very serious about it because I'm just, I'm very concerned about some of the trends that I, I, I see in uh, U.S. politics. I studied in the U.S. and worked in, in the U.S. And, you know, there are some issues there. And I think one of the reasons is that some people, they feel that they are more isolated than before. And then you have, you know, uh, the avi aviation industry. And when people meet and they talk, it reduces the likelihood that you want to be in a conflict with that individual. So from a, you know, a political point of view, uh, the aviation industry is very important. And tourism, you know, when you visit a country, you become more positive. 
Absolutely, and I think that what I'm hearing from you there is that aviation really encourages humanity. And because if, you, if you've got another person there in front of you, it turns a vague idea about something into a person, a representative, an actual place, rather than what people might build in their head as an image. So it's literally human connection. I mean, I'm allergic to Teams meetings. Seriously, I'm like, oh, is this person going to be on Teams? Okay, oh, that's not good. <laughs> But, but of course, I'm kidding a little bit, but, but it really matters. If people don't meet and they can't have the, you know, a candid conversation, uh, you'll have a less successful operations. I was just going to build on what everybody said so far, and I think it's kind of a great lead up to a, a combination of, you talked about political, you talk about social, you talk about economic, all those things work together here. And I looked some of the stats kind of um, similarly to, to what you laid out. But I just looked at the last 20 years. And if you think about um, the aviation market in Europe in the last 20 years, city pairs have doubled, um, right? They maybe quadrupled since the 90s and doubled since uh, 2003. Still some room left because probably about 1,000 to 2,000 city pairs need to be recovered into the system since the pandemic. But how, how, where's the composition? And to me, what's fascinating to see is since the liberalization of the market, um, sure, Western European, Northern European um, markets have grown, maybe two, two and a half percent per year. Southern European markets grown twice as fast. Eastern European markets grown four times as fast. And so you see it's really creating the balance and, and, and it's connecting people, it's connecting politics, it's connecting economies, but it's also bringing the whole level of, of interaction and um, connectivity up, which benefits everybody. And so what that does is creates a stronger economy, that creates investment, and you know, our supply chain, um, just from Boeing's perspective, we spend billions of dollars a year with suppliers in, in the European market because it's connected. And I'm sure our, our competitor does more, right, because of their base here. And so I feel like it's, a, it's, it's more than beneficial, it's ultimately um, a, a part of a cycle that creates more value. And our goal is to obviously continue to create more innovation, to, to build sustainability into it. But you look back and you see how magical that liberalization has been in terms of connecting this continent, but also the, the rest of the continent to the world. And I think um, you, you don't want to do anything but find more ways to facilitate that going forward. Yeah, absolutely, and we were talking about sort of the younger people, they might not remember what it was like to have two airlines on each route, uh, to have a very structured organization of fares, frequencies, all that sort of thing. So again, do you realize what you have when it's always there? And perhaps COVID really did serve to highlight that. Um, like the way that you mentioned Eastern Europe there. Um, in 1999, I did as part of my degree at Cranfield University, I had to do some route forecasting. I did some forecasting between the UK and Prague, and it was spectacularly incorrect. <laughs> it would have completely flunked because low-cost carriers came onto the route. It really boosted the market, increased the competition, and sunk my forecast so far down into the ground that we won't mention it, sure. but yeah, completely. Now, as Boeing, you mentioned there about uh, the presence of manufacturers on different continents. So clearly it's important for Boeing to have a presence in Europe as well as the US as well as the rest of the world. And I'm wondering sort of whether you can see differences emerging between those markets compared with doing business in the US versus doing business in Europe. Kind of what's the experience there? That's a great question. And, you know, from a supply chain perspective, I think the key is to have a diverse, you know, uh, group of suppliers. Also, you know, I think the ability to, to get to skilled labor as well as technology where it exists, but also invest where you need to. And I think, you know, over the last 20 years, um, we've developed a global supply chain, that globalization is, is such an important piece of it, but also an efficient one. And I think obviously the, the last few years notwithstanding, that has benefited the whole industry. And I think our goal going forward is to continue to have that investment because um, each area, each supplier brings their own um, expertise. And ultimately, that makes us more efficient, more capable, and more sustainable. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I think the key is to find where those strengths are and then build on them. Yeah. If I may jump in a bit on the skills sure. part, which uh, I think we should emphasize a bit more. 
So we're speaking also of an era where we're looking at technological advancements, which are already with us, but also as the European Union, we're putting forward not only the environmental targets, which we're seeing in the Fit for 55 package, which obviously is a huge package, an ambitious one, an important one, but one which we need to support not only with the legislative framework, but with other, um, other pieces of policy, other funds and other aspects. So it's important that when we look at the Fit for 55, we don't look at it in isolation. And here, for example, the um, Digital Decade program, which we worked upon in, in ITRE a few, a few weeks ago, comes to mind, a few months ago comes to mind, because it's important that we also have these digital targets when it comes to connectivity, when it comes to the human skills, and when we speak of human skills, we're speaking of our SMEs, our entrepreneurs, our businesses, and the workers within them having some basic skills, because some are fine with basic skills, even within the aviation industry. But then we need to look also at targets and on delivering on skills which are on the higher end and which are more advanced. And if we want to be at the forefront also in, in the aviation field, and in the other transport modes as the European Union, we should not only look at the environmental aspect, which is key, but also at the skill set of our, uh, our, our workers, our entrepreneurs, our companies, including our SMEs, because that's really key. Technology is fast developing, and you can uh, maybe speak more from the industry side on what you see in, 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 this, in this field and what are your perceptions, but it's key that we really keep the skills in mind and we deliver upon them. Because at the end of the day, the aviation, as, as the minister said here, aviation and the air transport, that plane that you catch is the first also step for the tourists to reach a country or a region. And that's very much important. We need to have the, the, the whole package of good quality service there, including when it comes to new technologies coming, coming out, which are already being implemented in certain airports, including when it comes to security check-in, which facilitate a lot and avoid some uh, queuing problems. And it's key that, that we look at this collectively too. Can I, can, I, can I build on that briefly on the I'm, technology? I'm going to jump in and oh. moderate one tiny bit because there's three bits of moderation to happen right now. Uh, one of them is to remind everybody that you can put in your questions via Slido. We've got about 10 minutes, I think, of the panel left. So just a reminder that put your questions in there. If any come through, they should appear on this screen for me. So at the moment, it looks as though we don't have any questions. I don't know if that's correct, but we don't see any just yet. Uh, also, Lilia had wanted to jump in before, so then we'll come over to you, Carlos. So just briefly, uh, as, since we're talking about the importance of the uh, aviation industry in Europe and also the transatlantic link. I mean, for us, when we had COVID, as I just mentioned in my uh, introductory remarks, you can just imagine for a country that has, like, at that time, 35% of its export revenues basically being, you know, cut down. Uh, you know, in COVID, and then, you know, it's so important for the GDP. Obviously, we had to put in place, like, extensive economic packets in order just to make all the companies and tourism and in the flight industry survive. Uh, and people would say, you know, oh, everything is going to change after COVID. People are not going to travel as much and yada, yada, yada. But the opposite is actually happening. And I always said that we would rather see, like, the roaring 20s after COVID instead of people being more passive. And one of the things that we've seen already in the year 2023 is like 95, 95, uh, we've recovered in, in tourism after COVID. So, and another variable I would like to add in the conversation, which I think is industry, because uh, aging populations, people live longer. And I think that's also going to have a positive effect on tourism and connectivity because people have more spare time. And what do people do in their spare time? They travel, they want to see the world. So I think there are a lot of very positive opportunities in tourism and in, in, in the industries that we all very much like. Mm -hmm. Now you. I'd say there is the wrong cliche that it's the young people that go to bars, but I'm finding out as I pass decades, it's the contrary. As we yeah, get older, so we go more, that's also in your, that's also in your <laughs> domain of bars and restaurants and so on. So. The age of uh, fun. <laughs> Yeah. But if I may just uh, uh, briefly, not, not to change the subject, sorry, but on the, on the uh, link more with Josiane on technology, I really do think that these guys 
this guy's being the manufacturer is being Boeing. And ca can I mention your competitor? You sure can. I wouldn't want to get to make you, you upset, sure Darren. So Airbus too. Uh, Boeing and Airbus do a terrific job, really, on technological. I know you were referring everything, right? Digital, airport, etc. But really, our biggest part is is aircrafts, and these guys keep on putting out better and better and better products with better engines, more efficient, etc. That that's a big thing, right? This industry, in my opinion, is very uh, progressive thinking and very technology driven. But since we're in Brussels, and also being an MP or a minister on my right, etc., I think the biggest thing back on this debate, not debate, but comparison, let's say, Europe and what we're doing, what are the Americans doing? If you look at the Inflation Reduction Act, the biggest thing is the incentive on SAF. I mean, for us as an industry, there are a lot of other things, uh, but SAF gets a big production. In Europe, what are we deba debating? We're debating if it's 5% or 6% of SAF mandate by 2030. Like Carson said, there is no production. You know, so we need we to. We need to focus more on incentivizing the production, not only big, on the big targets. Thing. One big thing. I'll say one thing. Oh, sorry, of your competitor, but Airbus, we fly their shuttle, and we put in all flights 35% every day of SAF, which is huge, right? But that's I don't know how, how Airbus does that, but it's again, it's still very limited. You know, that's the only good example I can think of. The other big thing that again, this is repeating Air 4E themes, but it's important in this forum. The other thing that you guys, all the politicians and member states, can do is the famous single European sky. And I know that everybody knows that, but you know, again, just to put this figure, again, not only on, on CO2 impact, uh, Karsten showed before, right, 19% less uh, Milan to Paris. Uh, Karsten was mentioning, see, that was uh, Johan. Uh, Karsten was mentioning uh, Frankfurt to Paris, 15%. The studies I've seen are more 10 to 15% less if we had a very efficient uh, single European sky. And just to be clear, it is now, it is this year, everybody thinks that, you know, the Swedish presidency, the Spanish presidency, so it'd be great to get all core member states aligned around that. And I'll finish this with one example. That actually, that 10, 15%, that's actually the share of, you know, Spain or of Germany or the UK, if you want to, to still include them in that count. So we would get all the flights out of Germany for free from a CO2 emission perspective if we just agreed on running it more efficiently. So again, sorry, I've taken it a little bit to regulation, but this being Brussels, I think that's seriously the single biggest thing, and it'd be great that we can finally get it done, Make I think, progress. hopefully this year. Yeah, looking forward yeah. to that. Um, we've sorry, got, took it to uh, the no. A4E agenda. No, no, it's fine. <laughs> we've got two questions that have come in, so I'm going to read both of those out. Uh, can you elaborate on how you expect sustainability will become part of the values sought by consumers? And then also, could aviation benefit from cooperation with other transport modes under multi-modality or not? Uh, so we have about five minutes left. Uh, would you like to come in with any thoughts on either of those topics? And also, if anybody in the room wants to put their hand up, I'll come back to you uh, in a moment. So if you've got a question brewing actually in the audience, um, I'll come back to you in one moment. I'll go quickly on these two. Um, uh, maybe the... The guys from the industry could help us a bit more, but definitely from studies that I read, it's, there's, there are statistics which even show that uh, the, the, the tourists are becoming more eco-conscious, and I believe that within certain fields, there's already this eco-conscious drive, and there are customers who actually are already looking at this eco-conscious aspect, as they are also expecting certain digital solutions to be offered and integrated, especially since the pandemic. Uh, otherwise, when it comes to multimodality, definitely, even as the European Union, we are trying to incentivize multimodality. And indeed, I myself as a consumer, for example, when I travel from Malta to Strasbourg, there are no direct um, aviation connections. If there were, I'd take that option. But since there aren't, sometimes, for example, I prefer um, taking a, um, a first leg of the journey with, with a plane and then uh, uh, traveling by train because it's a comfortable connection. So yes, multimodality is important. And I think if we want to provide a, a good level of service to our tourists, our passengers, we should incentivize it more and the industries should work more uh, cross-party. Yeah, and I suspected that this topic might come up. So the other report that was a sister one to this was about completing the transport jigsaw. So it seems as though we're still having the kind of conversations that were back in 1997 about multimodality, what still needs to be done. And in these reports, I was surprised to see actually quite a strong focus on environment too, which considering that that was quite a long time ago, uh, I thought was notable. Mm -hmm. Lilia, you want yeah, to? Yeah, I just want to comment on that, that and uh, sustainability. I think we, 
we are in the age of sustainability and AI, and it's going to be very connected. And plus innovation and uh, efficiency uh, as regards to an energy. And uh, the key thing going forward is innovation and make things more uh, sustainable and greener. And I think we're going to see so much uh, new inventions uh, taking place in the next, you know, uh, five to ten and fifteen years. So we're going to be driven by technology, uh, innovation, and um, AI. Okay. I'm just going to open that back up to the room. So if there's anybody in the room that has a burning question, please raise your hand and wave it around a lot because these lights are very bright. No, I think we're good. Um, if you've been missed, yell. Um, so I think we're going to have to go on to a final question now. And I'm being pulled back to a theme that came in during the press conference this morning, which I'm sure many people in the room wouldn't have been there for. So um, I think it was Carsten Spohr from Lufthansa who said that on the one hand, the benefits of aviation are very well recognized and um, particularly advocating for the consumer is very much what European politics is about, making sure that they get choice, competition, and everything. So on the one hand, we have a very clear understanding of the benefits of aviation and a real push for a good air transport industry. On the other hand, the policy side of it, from what I hear from the airline CEOs, doesn't necessarily seem to always back that up. They seem to be almost in two separate camps. And uh, again, we were hearing this morning about how Europe might be at risk of losing the race in terms of getting ahead in SAF production right now. So it's an open one to all of the panel. We probably don't have time to take final comments from each of you. But do you have any burning thoughts on that, on this idea of how do we reconcile those two sides to make sure that we support a thriving air transport industry? Sustainability should go in hand in hand. And I think that when we speak of sustainability, we should look at the economic, environmental, and social aspects, as I said earlier on. And definitely, we need this constant dialogue in between policymakers and the industry researchers and GOs, because yes, it's a challenge for everyone, and it's difficult to achieve that balance, but we need to continue the discussion going and continue working together in this field. Yeah, I would say, you know, from, from my perspective, just going to the beginning of the conversation, we're in the business of connectivity. Um, one of the things we're also in the business of is innovation. And anything that we can do as, as a policy or as, an, as a manufacturing system to enable um, more efficiency, enable uh, the investment to find the way to more efficiency is a win-win. And so, you know, just, just thinking of it this way, our industry is uniquely, one of the unique industries in that um, Innovation drives growth, right? We've, we've made our aircraft over the last 50 years 70% more fuel efficient, 90% quieter. But we can do better, but we need that investment, that enabling to, to change the, the, the fueling from um, you know, Jet A to sustainable aviation fuel. That hurdle can easily be achieved, but we need the scale and that investment and that incentive to drive that investment because ultimately it needs to be lower cost otherwise we can't continue to grow and provide those connectivity benefits to the market mm -hmm. thank you any final thoughts from you carlos or lilia uh, luckily well, what my colleague especially lilia was saying i like a lot i think it's and also what what uh, darren and uh, josian is uh, you know i mean w w my own words if you want europe is about connectivity and it's definitely green it's chosen so those two need to marry i like lilia's idea that technology and artificial intelligence is going to come in to the help. Mm -hmm. You know, so we've always had human ingenuity has always, you know, brought us where we are. It's always done tremendously well. And people always have thought, oh, there is something bad, something bad. It's always the present is bad. The past was more brilliant. And yet we always overcome. And I think here now, especially with the help of technology, artificial intelligence, you know, there's going to be a huge, a huge boost, totally couldn't agree more, of finding solutions that are going to be very effective. The one thing we ask for as airlines, to bring it to your question more in hand is again, South uh, production increase because else we will be talking but not being able to really reduce that one yeah. impact. But th that's, that's what I think. And we just this week had EasyJet release their vision for what flying will be like in 2070. So if you want to look any more into the uh, interesting predictions that they make uh, using artificial intelligence and technology, that's something to look at. Lydia, do you want to wrap up? 
Yes, uh, I think this is, you know, we are living in a very interesting times and I think, you know, it's going to be innovation, it's going to be sustainability, it's going to be technology. But the key thing in order for us to be successful and it's to be inclusive and we need to have a level a playing field for all nations in Europe and uh, I think the transatlantic link is extremely important and we need to, you know, countries with uh, similar values, they, they need to... Uh, work together in order to uh, take this transformation into the new age. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, you know, it's all very well having this focus on the multimodal, you know, potentially the replacement of aviation with other transport modes. But for example, using Iceland, trains aren't an alternative to get across Iceland. So therefore, it is aviation. So we need to find a way of doing that as sustainably as possible to keep up the connectivity to the southern regions, to the northern regions, and all across Europe. So I think that wraps up our conversation. I would like to invite you to join me in thanking our panelists for taking the time to have this dinner party conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Cheers. And Graham's going to come back to the stage to move us on to our next segment.